Hello and good morning. My name is Eda Özel and I'm a graduate student. Um, and it's very nice to be here and uh, present to present some of my work. Um, so uh, my research is actually about um, 15th century, uh, 16th century and um, the Grand Admiral of the Ottoman Navy. But uh, I became interested in captivity accounts when I was reading about him and then um, I became um, interested in this project. Um, so uh, the, during the expansion of the European world economy uh, through the 16th and 18th centuries uh, the, in the Mediterranean world, uh, it coincided with the period often called the Golden Age of Piracy. Um, there was a heightened interest um, in acquisition of first-hand knowledge on uh, North African region, and the number of captives in the region was continually increasing uh, from mid 16th to early 19th centuries. Um, increased frequency of encounters between travelers, uh, merchants and sailors of the Mediterranean states, and the pirates of the North African coast um, accompanied the increased volume of trade. Um, piratical activities which involved plunder and captive taking in the Mediterranean were among the main issues of conflict uh, which um, involved um, um, which um, turned expansionary periods of world economy from 16th to 19th centuries away from being peaceful processes of exchange of commodities. During this period we find that captivity accounts were um, among the popular publications and the content and uh, tone of captivity accounts changed across captive authors of different origins. Um, building of a British national identity and institutional elements related to global expansion of our economy influenced captivity accounts um, published and read in England to a significant extent. Thus, the differences um, in these two interconnected processes, in other words, the building of a national identity and commercial expansion, are reflected in captivity accounts and they appear as the most obvious reasons to account for any change in the British perception of captivity in North Africa. In the present study, however, I will additionally account for uh, special aspects of the Ottoman naval engagements um, in as much as they were linked uh, to the raided trade routes and war zones via the North African provinces. The geographical extent of the process um, of global expansion and the piratical engagements instigated by the subjects of the North African provinces and their concurrence with official warfare will be presented to have made a difference in the experience of the captives. Um, in this context, um, an answer will be sought to the larger question of uh, to what extent the differences um, in the captives' accounts originated from the integration of North Africa into the Ottoman domain and to what extent the encounter between British, British expansion and Ottoman naval conquests. Um, to this end, um, the geographical distribution of all pirate activities that involved uh, capture and enslavement uh, by the subject of the North African provinces between circa 1500 to uh, 1650 will be juxtaposed uh, with the official warfare recorded in uh, Tufetil Kibar of uh, Katip Çelebi. Um, so this is a source um, in which uh, Katip Çelebi focuses on the history of the maritime wars from uh, late 15th century until his time. Uh, the timing of the production of the book uh, was in the um, Hijra year of 1067 and it is um, 1656 or 15, 1657 um, in the uh, Gregorian calendar. Uh, this was a very strategic time um, and a very critical point in the campaign of Crete, uh, a time when the Ottoman fleet had now been struggling to capture the island for more than a decade and the Venetians were still able to maintain the blockade in Gallipoli with, successful con with stressful consequences for the Ottoman administration. So in his book, Katip Çelebi presents um, a, selec a selection of the best practices uh, from, a list of naval, uh, from a list of past naval campaigns. Um, in, and, the, and he writes uh, the book in his encyclopedic style. Um, for, the present, for the purposes of the present study, 
Therefore, 252 Kibar constitutes a valuable source for uh, mapping. Um, and um, I also want to say a couple of words about the captivity accounts. Um, since most scholarly work uh, focuses on establishing self-images or national identities of captives, demonstrating how the public perception of captivity varied as a, uh, as a consequence of commercial expansion processes. Um, and since these self-images and um, national identities later became part of a uh, larger discourse that sought legitimization for European colonial expansion in North Africa, it is worth considering in a broader view how these captives um, who were directly affected uh, by the experience of captivity perceived and reflected um, their captors. So in these lines, um, the study does not aim to use this, uh, these accounts to get an idea of the relationship between the captives and the captors um, or to acquire an image of the captors, but um, it's rather to understand the world of captives in the ways that they were presented to the public. Um, Corsairing in the Mediterranean, um, as had existed since antiquity, uh, was not inhibited by the geographical conditions, but rather promoted by them. Especially the southern coast of the Mediterranean from Syria to Algiers, uh, surrounded by uh, the Sahara Desert, desert, desert uh, pushed livelihood uh, to the coastal zones, a geography where the peaceful merchantman and the pirate on the other hand, and uh, the man of war and the corsair on the other, um, were hard to tell from one another. The tradition of seafaring in that region also included activities of corsairing um, as a means of making a living in the Mediterranean. Such activities um, formed what came to be known as uh, Barbary piracy with its own customs, and, um, agreements, negotiations, and its own conventions and regularities. In the first half of 16th century, um, naval wars became common in the Mediterranean as the war booties were so great that these states occasionally sent out fleets for attacking coasts, commonly risking bankruptcy in, in the case of defeat. Nevertheless, uh, towards the end of the century, um, official war, in Brodel's words, uh, moved into Northern Europe and the Mediterranean was left with its secondary minor forms. This was mainly because, of, because the resources of the Mediterranean states to finance war were exhausted, and thus um, there was a compulsory peace. Um, yet the competition over the Mediterranean trade continued and even flourished, bolstering the remunerations of piracy and thus allowing for privateering to fill the gaps of vanishing official war. Um, so here uh, we see the uh, map of the official wars that are recorded in, uh, broad, in uh, Katip Celebi's Tufe uh, Kibar, And um, the legends, uh, and I prepared the legends in a way that, that, that would make uh, the most meaningful clusters. Um, so when the official war dwindled at the end of the 16th century, giving way to privateering, the Mediterranean states started justifying piracy. This meant the replacement of war expenses with acquisition of revenue from uh, provision of protection services for the states. Corsairs gained a higher degree of freedom, at least on part of the state they served. And for some merchants, this meant an increase in their protection rents relative to their rivals so that they gained advantage over um, their trade in the Mediterranean. During the expansionary period of uh, the British economy, uh, emergence of new social and economic institutions and adaptation of uh, some of the existing ones facilitated the commercial and diplomatic links between North Africa and other parts of the world. The British captivity narratives uh, gained much attention during this period when public perception um, of the capture of the country's citizens bore direct links to the formation of national identity. Specifically, within a context of religious conflict between Islam and Christianity that deepened to illustrate the public interest um, in first-hand knowledge of this geography. There was an already accepted image of the Muslims when the captives of the 16th and 17th centuries were authoring their accounts. The image of Muslim or the Turk in Europe was instituted as a consequence of both a long diplomatic history and an ancient social interaction between the two sides of the Mediterranean since the early Middle Ages. The frontier between the world of Islam and Christendom in the Mediterranean, even though it might not have existed so much in the case of piratical acts, was a much, much outspoken concept. In the contemporary parlance, 
Muslim Christian divide was undeniably present, a separation to which almost every individual involved in the maritime world did at least pay lip service. Yet, uh, the introduction of a separation in the form of two clashing civilizations um, defined in terms of binary oppositions of the haves and have-nots uh, was a later development for the North, North African regencies. In fact, the Mediterranean Sea was initially a frontier zone containing groups of people that we may call frontier populations, where loyalties and alliances were constantly changing um, and a complex system of motives for piracy and enslavement prevailed on both coasts of the Mediterranean by early 17th century. Most captives in the Ottoman Empire were sent to slave markets for sale, but um, there were also those uh, few with a possibility of yielding a high amount of ransom payment, um, whose captors uh, retained them in prisons. In general, use of slaves as a source of labor power uh, was uh, limited um, in the manufacturing sector um, in the cities, and they were not used in agricultural production at all. Indeed, most slaves sold in the slave market were intended uh, for household service or for um, galley slavery. Furthermore, North African region, along with the Hungarian border, provided a major part of uh, slave supply for various other parts of the empire. Um, for the North African Corsairs, the number of um, European travelers, whatever purposes of trip they had, was increasing um, throughout the 16th century, and they were among the high profit bearing cargoes um, carried within the Mediterranean maritime networks. The captives were either sold at some slave market or kept to be ransomed or traded in exchange for Muslim captives. And captives sold in the slave markets would usually serve within the households in various parts of the Ottoman Empire. Um, even though uh, slavery was not a significant source of labor power in the Ottoman economy, slave trade was one of the most profitable economic activities. And slave market was one of the liveliest markets throughout the empire. Um, and um, the captives uh, that would be retained in expectation for ransom would usually serve as galley slaves, as I said, um, or would be imprisoned. Uh, most often the memoirs of captives and the literature employing these um, accounts um, as sources describe the experiences of captivity as involving extremely violent and uh, torturous treatments. The North African pirates were the scourge of Christendom uh, while they acted as the shock troops on the front line of the defense of the Islamic world. And ultimately, uh, the only way Europe could find to deal with this scourge uh, was to conquer the Barbary, sweeping away the corsairs in a tidal wave of colonialism. Um, it was in the second half of the 16th century that travel logs and captivity accounts became trendy, trendy genres among the popular publications. The Barbary pirates frequently captivated travelers, merchants, and sailors from Britain and North America, whose accounts later formed a significant part of the captivity genre. It's important to look at the captivity accounts as sources written for people who had an image of the Turk in their minds, be it accurate or not, and consider that in their claim to accuracy for their accounts, um, the authors might have aspired to attract the attention of the public without necessarily telling them the truth. Um, so here is a map for um, the, um, the instances of captive taking um, in, um, in the Mediterranean. Um, and there are uh, some instances in which there were um, more than 88,000 captives were taken in just one raid. Um, in his account dating, dated um, 1577, John Fox mentions um, 200, three score, and eight Christian prisoners of 16 sun-dry nations, among which were three Englishmen, where of, uh, one was named John Fox, of Woodbridge of Suffolk, um, and other William Whitney of Portsmouth in the country of Southampton, and the third Robert Moore of Harwich in the country of Essex. Uh, the prisoners succeeded in taking uh, over a ship in Alexandria and making an escape uh, which would realize um, which they could realize with the help of God. Uh, Mo Fox mostly gives the details of their miraculous escape, and similarly, about a decade after Fox, um, Richard Hasselton, who was captivated by the Turks, uh, was later captured by uh, the Spanish and brought before the Inquisition from a shipwreck of the um, galley in which he was an oar slave for five years. 
uh, describes the torments he endured and uh, his escape in great detail. Rowland's uh, writing in 1622, however, alludes to uh, British government's neglect of common seamen and use of English boys as slaves. In mentioning the professions in which the British slaves were used more than other nations, Rowland makes a remark about his situation uh, to emphasize the antagonism between <coughs> being English and being a slave. Similarly, Thomas Phelps finds it most difficult for someone of British origin to be in bondage um, to those uh, upon whom God and nature seems to have impressed characters of slavery um, to the rest of mankind, as he considers um, British being British to mean being liberated. Um, Neville Matar captures this change in tone of the accounts of the British captives after they became acquainted with the North African culture um, and uh, began writing about the environment rather than their personal ordeals, um, their fate and their commitment to religious and national identity. Accounts after 1640, however, were more descriptive and informative giving details about the lands, customs, government, and religion of the Muslims. And in these later accounts, the metaphor of barbarity, drawing a comparison between North African corsairs um, and native populations, commercial expansion was presented as a trigger for the victimization of the sailors and explorers of British origin. Oakley devotes a section in his account, um, dated 1675, to some remor remarkable observations uh, that he gleaned up in Algeria, uh, describing the senseless uh, religious practices and eating habits and cruel punishments um, they exercised. Um, Rawlins also mentions the cruelty and uh, inhumanity of Turks and Moors, especially if they grow into the violent rages of piracy, uh, quote, or fall into the uh, exorbitant course of uh, selling of slaves, unquote and uh, uses both turning Turk and being uh, Mohammedan to refer to conversion to Islam. While the general reason for the animosity against the captives um, is the hate for, uh, quote, all Christians and Christianity, unquote, of Turks and Moors from a native barbarousness, um, in a specific evan event, um, Rawlins observes that um, the reason of the cruelty is the revenge the Turks wanted to get because of an attempt uh, of the English fleet to burn the Algerian Corsair fleet. Um, such a change, according to Matar, uh, resulted from the increasing familiarity of the British public with uh, Barbary piracy, and also with the forging of, national, of a national identity closely associated with slavery. This was an, uh, this was an identity of power and expansion based on um, Protestant election, capitalist enterprise, enterprise and uh, naval superiority, mainly crafted after uh, the Great Migration to the Americas in the 1630s. Uh, with some Englishmen turning into colonialists and plantation owners, dominating and oppressing natives, uh, conquering adversaries, and designating themselves as God's own standard bearers. Thus, Matar suggests that concerns about the destabilizing effects of captivity on the emergent national identity of the British resonated in uh, later captivity accounts. The Ottoman presence in the Mediterranean uh, before the incorporation of Algiers, Tunisia, and Tripoli in the Ottoman domain um, was mostly confined to the agency with very few instances um, of captive taking. So here we see um, uh, on the right, um, on the left, uh, that um, the uh, uh, the um, official wars that were um, undertaken by the Ottoman Navy, and then in the second uh, we see the only two um, captive-taking practices that uh, happened between 1510 and 1516. So I will be very quickly going through these. Um, Yes, okay. Um, so the institution of an Ottoman ad administration um, uh, in North Africa um, sort of sh made a shift uh, of the naval wars towards the West, and then there was an increase in the captive-taking practices um, in the Western Mediterranean uh, during uh, the period of 1520 and 1550, and then um, 
With the capture of Tunis in uh, 1574, uh, the Ottomans had established firm control over um, and, uh, and connections of mutual reliance with the North Africa. And now we see that the um, naval engagements are even further uh, pushed towards the West and also the captive taking practices following that uh, pattern. Um, and then finally, um, in the beginning of the uh, 17th century, the only naval engagement that the Ottomans were um, officially involved was the campaign of Crete, whereas the uh, captive taking practices uh, was taking sway during that time. Uh, and until the French occupation, uh, the North African regencies uh, remained allies to the port, but they were rather autonomous political entities. And after the turn of the 18th century, Barbary corsairs were then able to establish political vantage to a certain extent, uh, which can be observed in the special interaction between Ottoman maritime policy and North African corsairing activities. Piracy in such a political context was part of the larger Mediterranean economy and managed to survive well into the 20th century through manipulation of political connections. Um, okay, um, and just I think one um, thing that I can uh, mention about in, in the form of conclusion would be um, that um, the theme of barbarity um, uh, of other societies was replacing the morality and uh, the perseverance in talking about pirate brutality. Um, but this was not uh, just um, something that was coming out of uh, the uh, global expansion of the British economy, but rather um, it had links to the territorial expansion of the Ottoman Empire and also uh, the slave-taking practices of the North African regencies that uh, followed the, the pattern of territorial expansion. Thank you. Thank you.